Hello, Walter. Thank you for joining us on our, this interview. We want to talk today a little bit about some of the things that are happening in Rome with the new Pope. Uh, you've heard, obviously, about the new Pope, Pope Francis, and the, some of the things that people are saying about him. Um, let's begin first with the news about ben Benedict retiring. What do you what do you think of that? This is the first time a pope has ever retired in 600 years. But well, Benedict did give some previous indications that he might retire. Also, in the symbolic gestures towards the previous pope that had actually retired. So maybe they were working on a time frame. Maybe there was a time frame involved where the actual people it, with the power structures in place could take over at the appropriate time. And I think that's what happened. So you think they had it all planned beforehand? I think they're working on the time schedule. The Vatican does nothing haphazardly. They are a well-oiled machine, they are well-structured, they know where they are heading, and they have a plan. And uh, this plan has to go into fruition, and they will do everything that is necessary to achieve that. What about some of the things we've been hearing about accusations against Pope Benedict of crimes he may have committed? Well, the Vatican, Vatican leaks are a very fascinating part of the Vatican modern history. And one doesn't know what is happening behind the scenes, whether there is any particular thing that is being covered up. We can only go from what the media says. But the Vatican is a master chameleon. It will adopt the shape and form that it has to in order to further its interests. And even negative news is good news for the Vatican if it can be used in the in the right way. That's true. Do you believe that they were going to charge Pope Benedict with anything? I don't know whether they were going to charge him. There's no evidence that they were, although people were talking about cover-ups and financial dealings and all issues like that. It could have played a role. But personally, I think that the time has come for the people who have their power structures in place to actually start exercising that power. The world is in a, in a fascinating state of flux. And to have a Jesuit Pope at this stage is, is phenomenal. Now, apparently, the Jesuits are normally in a support role to the papacy, you know, the head of the Jesuits is referred to as the Black Pope. And the, the whole aim and function of the Jesuit order, the very reason for its existence, is to counteract the Reformation and to reinstate the papacy into the same power position that it had during the Dark Ages. That is the only reason why the Jesuits were created and why they exist. And it's fascinating to me that he took the name Francis, but they didn't initially announce which Francis. Now, there are two St. Francis. The one is the Francis of Assisi, who is the patron saint of the poor. But of course, St. Francis of Assisi, the great patron of the poor, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very good catchphrase. But the other one, the other St. Francis, was St. Francis Xavier. And Franz Xavier was co-founder of the Jesuit order together with Ignatius Loyola. And it's fascinating that he was also the first missionary um, Jesuit who went to India, to Goa, uh, where the, the Portuguese had opened up trade routes. But it's fascinating that he there found Christians probably from an earlier era, maybe even from the apostolic times, because the gospel went into those regions. And these people were keeping certain uh, Jewish laws, and uh, they were keeping the Sabbath and not the Sunday. And so he asked for the Inquisition to be instigated. 
So that is the other side of the story. And a question that pops into my mind is whether a Jesuit would honor a Jesuit founding saint or whether he would not. But be that as it may, the Jesuits are famous for their twin doctrines, one for the outside world, one for the inside world, one for public consumption, as it were, one for insider consumption. So by taking the name Francis, he might be sending a double message. That's very interesting. You mentioned also that the Jesuits usually have a supportive role. How does it now that the Jesuits are in a front position, how does that change the power of the papacy? When, when does one come out of the closet? When it's no longer necessary to stay in the closet, isn't that correct? That's right. Yes. Now, if you if you take the power structures, you know, if you if you look at uh, political systems, you know, they say that behind every successful leader there stands a Jesuit. It has always been like that in the past. Many of the associates that deal with the modern presidents are Jesuits or Jesuit trained, and. Uh, they have always been advisors in political and financial systems. They uh, control many, many corporations and financial institutions behind the scenes using one front organization or the other. Uh, they say that the, the CIA director is Jesuit trained, that many of the European leaders are Jesuit trained. Many of the presidents of the United States were students of Jesuit institutions. Uh, Georgetown University, for example, the very famous Jesuit institution where some of the presidents had been trained. The Jesuits behind the scenes are controlling not only aspects of the economy, but also the political scene, the media scene. Many of the, the main media moguls are Jesuit trained. And of course, the religious scene. Spiritual formation is a Jesuit speciality. And it has creeped into every, every form of Christianity. So behind the scenes, they are very active. But none of these systems actually are biblical. Yeah, it's very interesting that so many of them are now coming out of the closet, so to speak, and letting it be known that they're Jesuits or Jesuit trained, even though they're in, in higher levels of government. That's correct. You know, much of the history of the world has been rewritten. We know that curricula have changed and that uh, many historic events are portrayed totally different in in modern media or modern encyclopedias than they were in the past. It's an interesting fact that uh, history today is no longer the same as history a few years ago. Uh, it is well known that much of the history has been written and it is almost public knowledge that the Jesuits were behind uh, the rewriting of history, getting rid of some of the negative terminology regarding themselves. I mean, even a few years ago, the name Jesuit would uh, raise not only an eyebrow, but raise the hairs on the back of the necks of many people. And some of the statements that presidents have made regarding the Jesuit, all countries, there's not a country in the world, basically, that has not at some point or other banned the Jesuit order, for its subversive activities. And it seems as if that image has totally disappeared. And uh, that's very interesting. They've written themselves out of history and of many significant events, such as the gunpowder plot and, and many others. Yes, they've given themselves a good image of those people who work for the poor and uh, social justice and all of these things. Now, the very word social justice was coined by a Jesuit, Tolpanelli, in 1840. 
And to, to think that just a few years later, Marx wrote his communist manifesto. You see, the Jesuits have a mastered uh, masters at playing two sides of the same coin at the same time. And to put these double identity ideas into the world is their speciality. A prime example would be futurism and preterism. Both Jesuit ideologies, both diametrically opposed to each other, and yet between the two of them you can attain a synthesis. Preterism says that the the, the Antichrist came in the past. Futurism says the Antichrist will come in the future. Both of them Jesuit doctrines. Social justice. Well, this, it's interesting that this very Pope, the modern Pope, politically speaking, was not uh, averse to the idea of gay rights, particularly in the political sphere and the ramifications of financial implications to... Uh, gay partnerships, etc. But as a conservative Catholic, of course, he has to oppose it. So he's playing both sides of the same coin, this very, this very one that he's ruling now. Uh, social justice, I mean, that's a fascinating phrase. Basically, what you can say then is that social justice must somehow be aligned to redistribution of wealth. And uh, if we look at what's happening in the world, I mean, redistribution of wealth seems to be a very common catchphrase. And if you're looking at Cyprus at the moment, now I'm not, not saying that uh, this is all directly involved, but indirectly it's very interesting that what they call redistribution there, some people would like to call theft. And... Uh, Fascinating things that is hap that are happening there. You know, what is what does it mean to have social justice and to be so involved with the poor from a biblical perspective? The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money. And yes, we must be compassionate, and yes, we must have empathy for the poor, because many are dumped into positions not of their own doing. But uh, what we need to do is to uplift people. We need to uplift people so that people can can stand on their own legs and be uh, proud human beings to to hand out financial aid without upliftment is totally counterproductive. And I think that's where where the world is heading. Now, when the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, that doesn't mean that you have to get rid of all the money, but you must have an, an open spirit. For example, uh, if you take the biblical examples, there were many people who from their wealth supported uh, Christianity, and the Bible records them, Joseph. Nicodemus was a rich man who supported the early church financially. There's nothing wrong with, uh, with that. It's only wrong if you, if you have a love for money and, and a covetous spirit. So this is a, a gimmick. This is a gimmick to draw people to this poverty structure, which the Roman Catholic Church has always underscored. And if it could take us back to the Middle Ages, where everybody is a serf, and only uh, the top structure has any power or say and financial uh, backing, then it certainly would, because that's the best way to control people. Social justice is more of a, a Marxist idea of of well let's let's say handing out to the poor so that they can be maintained but it's not necessarily uplifting them it's taking control so the control structure stays within the power elite 
but the money and the wealth is redistributed so that everybody basically comes down to the same level. So if you, if you let's say, equalize the financial base, if you take from the rich and you give to the poor, uh, then everybody reaches the same level and then there is a form of social justice. But is, this, is it a workable justice or is everybody then a dependent, a dependent upon the state? And a dependent can be manipulated, a dependent can be controlled, a dependent can be, you know, kept exactly where the power elites want them to be, whereas an independent is a problem. So social justice seems to me a way of controlling the masses. Mm -hmm. Isn't it true that countries that have been predominantly Catholic have also been predominantly poor in times past? Yes. Uh, the Protestant nations were the prosperous nations. Now, I'm not I'm not favoring one political system over another at all. If I had to say what political system I favor, it's one that's not available on this planet. It's called the theocracy. God rules. God is in control. But God doesn't take away your freedom of choice, and God doesn't make you a serf. But people wanted a king, and ever since they had a king, they have to render unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar, but unto God what is due unto God. I think it's ironic that countries that have been predominantly Catholic and have kept the people in poverty, and yet here now we have a pope who claims to have such a, such a, a burden for the poor, when in reality the system that he leads has been instrumental in keeping the people in that poverty. Why they themselves live in pomp and glory. Yes, well, this one seems to not, apparently. He's chosen even a silver ring over a gold ring. Those are, those are symbolic gestures, and, I, and I, uh, knowing, knowing the Jesuit order and having studied the Jesuit order, I can, I can but smile at these, at these things. Because uh, if you if you go into the history of the Jesuit order, and uh, even go to South America, where you had the reductions, where they used the populace to mine the gold and to further the ends and to send the galleys, the Spanish galleys over the sea laden with gold, and uh, the the great conflicts that were financed with that in Europe to suppress the Reformation, or the, or the fascinating history of the, of the Dutch West India Company, which was raised up almost as a pirate organization to, to get hold of this gold and to, to grab these ships and to bring it to the Protestant side. Uh, it, it's, it's an amazing history and how the finances of the world were manipulated by the Jesuit order. I mean, these are all fascinating. Money, 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 that was the mainstay of the Jesuit order. Yes, well, we also know from history about the Vatican involved in the, the billions taken from World War II, and we don't know where it is, but... All the, the money laundering and uh, the interesting the interesting uh, Vatican banker scandals that we've had with uh, with the well almost for sure execution style Masonic rituals that were associated with with that sort of history. I mean, money is the big game. So, uh, to me personally. This financial humility is a great front for outside consumption. You know that uh, even the millennium end goals of the United Nations uh, intend to have uh, this eradication of the poor, in other words, social justice implanted by the year 2015. That's not very far away. I mean, if that is the, if that is the time frame, you need the people and the men who can run this this structure in place. 
uh, for such an event. So I, I am personally expecting many, many interesting changes to take place. And uh, those changes will disempower individuals. Uh, our, our monies will not be secure. Our pension funds will be controlled. Everybody will be under the control system. That's why I'm finding the, the Cyprus issue fascinating. Firstly, are we going to take the money directly out of their bank accounts? No, that's giving too much resistance. Let's try something else. Let's see. Let's control uh, and nationalize the pension systems or whether they be straight pension funds, whether they be provident funds, we'll nationalize them all and put them on an equal footing. Do you know that that's exactly the same thing, just in another form? So the individual capacity to control your life according to the dictates of your conscience will soon, I believe, be a thing of the past. And if I know what the Bible is saying, and if I know how the Bible treats the papacy and uh, the man of sin and what Protestantism has preached on these issues in the past, well, then I should not be surprised if history is showing me that these things are coming to fruition. My personal opinion is to preach the gospel of Christ, to preach it, in the context of the three angels' messages is something which has to be done now because the power structures will soon make it impossible to do it. I'm reading in the Star News that they say that the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, are regarded by Catholics as the pinnacle of smart priestliness that they are respected within the church for their intellectual vigor and that they have a reputation as a voice of conscience. The fact that we have a Jesuit Pope is significant because it just shows how successful the Jesuits have been in, in transforming their image. After all, weren't they responsible for the Inquisition, for the slaughter of Christians for centuries? And yet now they're regarded as something hip and modern? Absolutely. So they have done a great job in furthering their image. And uh, if, if you take the Jesuits, they, they say that the number of Jesuits is not that high in all the world. But there are so many front organizations and front organizations to those front organizations, which are all Jesuit controlled and Protestant institutions that have been infiltrated by Jesuits, they control education, but their spirituality is not a biblical spirituality. Their spirituality is an experiential religion and not a faith-bound religion. A faith-bound religion doesn't base its faith upon uh, experience. I mean, experiencing uh, certain states of mind and experiencing visualizations and encounter theologies and and uh, enrichment theologies. A true religion is word based. That is what Protestantism is all about. So what the Jesuits have succeeded in dramatically is a total change in spiritual direction from one that is absolutely word based to one that is totally experiential. And that, to me, is the most dangerous success that they have obtained. And most people are being seduced by, by all these theologies that they've started, by their image. Most people are falling for it. Even the elect are being deceived. Even the elect... To imagine that even some of the elect people that should know the Word of God are talking about uh, the Holy Spirit's involvement in choosing in choosing the papacy. I mean, that's in line with what Rick Warren is saying, who's also asked the exact same thing, that people should fast and pray, that 
you know, that the that the papacy, which would be elected under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we know what the Bible teaches in regard to this structure and how it has set itself up to take the place of God, then we are on very dangerous ground. In other words, they've sold the image so well that even those who should know better are running with the stream. Yes, you're absolutely right. And many heads of state are paying respects to the new pope and even dressed in the typical black, the black of mourning. Let me let me say that uh, the black has nothing to do with mourning. It is uh, something that has been worn by heads of states uh, even outside of any issues of mourning. Uh, the Queen of England, when she goes and visits the Pope, is dressed in black. So this is a sign of of submission yes. to that authority. The, the papacy has ruled over the uh, the hierarchies of the world throughout all the ages. In the past, it has done so openly, and now it has just succeeded in doing it clandestinely. Why do you think all these heads of state come just in black? Do you think they know what it means or are they just told this is protocol? I think most of them know what it means and some of them believe it is just protocol. I mean, even the pariahs of the world, like Robert Mugabe was there. And even though he has a worldwide a European ban on travel, uh, uh, this was an exception. And everybody knows that Mugabe was Jesuit trained. I mean, they even said so on, on CNN. I was quite surprised that they should mention that he was Jesuit trained. And there he was. You see, you, you can you can mention these people one after the other. Uh, the late Chavez of Venezuela, he was a great papal admirer. He is, there are many documentations of him being subservient to the papacy, kissing the ring. Uh, and whether you are from the left or whether you are from the right makes no difference because this is just a game. Uh, whether you stand for right politics, whether you stand for left politics. I, I mean, just look at Obama and Netanyahu at the moment. The one stands for left politics, the one stands for right politics, but they're making a great effort to show that they embrace each other. So we have uh, the Jesuit dialectic, the Hegelian system. You send the twins into the world, and then out of the two opposites, you create a synthesis. And we're, we're at the point of synthesis. The world is heading towards synthesis, a new world order based on social justice where everyone is equal. And if you dare pop your head above the horizon, uh, it must be lopped off. It's definitely time to work earnestly to spread the gospel and warn people of the man of sin, which is what we're instructed to do. Absolutely. And if, if, we, if we don't do it now, our opportunities will be wasted. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Walter, for talking with us. And God bless you in what you're doing now. And let us continue to work together to spread the gospel and the message. We have to preach the righteousness of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ and the gospel of salvation as it is in the Bible. Our time will be cut short very soon. Yes. Thank you, Walter. Thank you.